So today I want to talk about church membership in the, light, in the midst of all this going on in our world. Boy, what a thing to talk about, church membership. Uh, every year we try to kick off the year with recommitment to reading the Bible and recommitment to what church membership means. So uh, I want to talk to you about that this morning. All right, church membership is something that's way out of vogue, way out of fashion. And uh, man, people mostly don't like commitment to anything, especially church membership. What in the world is that all about? Why would you be talking about that? Well, I hope this morning to show you some of what God says about covenant church membership that will open your eyes to this identity, this belonging that we have in Jesus that everybody's looking for in other places, in a country, in a government, in a party, in a politician, in a leader, in everything else, in alcohol addiction, in sleep, in other things. We're looking, we're reaching for things to find value and want to matter. And it's never going to work. But what Jesus has done has given us what matters. We belong to him. And so I hope this morning, talking about Covenant Church membership will encourage your heart and, and help our church, all of us, just zero in on Jesus and what he's called us to be and do as the body of Christ. So I want to help us understand, embrace, and live covenant church membership in 2021. Church, let's do this, all right? Please take your notes. Get the sermon guide. It's in your bulletin. Follow along. There's a ton on there today. I hope it helps, okay? Let's read this text together. What? This text is about church membership? Well, get a load of this. Listen. This is Jesus speaking, Luke 12, 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, how they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you're to eat or what you're to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I'll stop there. You can see Jesus goes on, and he's speaking to his disciples more about who he is and what he's come to do to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth and to give the kingdom to the little flock. Don't be afraid, little flock. Listen, little flock. That's us. That's them, the disciples there, but it's the church of all ages. Little flock, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't reach and grasp for empty things. It's his good pleasure to give you all good things. So this text tells us some of God's covenant promises made to the church, to church members. These are God's covenant promises made to church members. Church members belong to the body. These are promises given to the body, to his people, followers of Jesus, This is meant to encourage and strengthen. It's also meant to explain to us more of what this covenant is. We're in a covenant with our Lord. He's made a covenant promise. We don't talk about covenant very often in our culture. We do at church because it's all in the Bible. A covenant is a vow. It's a commitment. It's a promise that will not be broken. Now, people break vows all the time. God never has, never has broken one, and he never will. So just look at these things promised to the followers of Jesus in this covenant promise. Look at verse 22 and following. Don't be anxious about your life, what you eat, your body, what you put on it. All these things he names here. His covenant promise is he will provide everything we need. Everything needed by his people. He provides it. It's a promise. He'll never break this promise. Jesus tells us not to worry about any of these things because they're going to be provided for us. Don't worry. Don't worry. Do we need to hear that? 
We need to hear that over and over and over. And Jesus is saying it. Don't worry. Over and over and over. It's a promise. He will provide. Verse 24, he provides our needs because he treasures us. Think of that. He treasures us. Verse 24 says, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Now, that's a great question. It's a great way for Jesus to say it, just to put the spotlight on. Oh, my goodness. Are you more valuable than birds? Of course you are. Now, all human beings are more valuable than birds, right? It's not a law that you can't murder birds. Well, there are a few because they're in danger, but I'm not talking about them. In general, birds, you hit one in your car, you don't go answer for hitting the bird. But people are different, right? People are different. They have great value, great worth, because they're made in the image of God. So all humans are of great worth, great value to God. But this text isn't talking about all people. This text is talking about specific people, those who are followers of Jesus, those who have been chosen by God, included in his covenant promise. Not all people are part of the covenant promise. Those who are followers of Jesus, who have turned from sin to trust Jesus, believe the gospel, they belong to him. This covenant promise is made to them. He treasures them in ways he doesn't treasure all humans. Now, all humans are of great worth, but believers, followers of Jesus, are treasured way more. Think of some of the things the Bible says about the followers of Jesus. Deuteronomy 32, God surrounds his chosen ones with his love and keeps them as the apple of his eye. The apple of God's eye. Followers of Jesus, church members, apple of his eye. He values, treasures, loves us. Ephesians 5.25, Jesus laid down his life for church members, for Christians. Laid down his life. That's the kind of love he has for us. Deep, deep love. Isaiah 54.10 states this incredible, beautiful sentence about his covenant promise. God says, My steadfast love will not depart from you. My covenant shall not be removed. And it goes on to say, even though the mountains fall down, even though the mountains pass away, my covenant will not be removed. That's what God thinks of us, and that's how he treasures us. Verse 30 goes on and says more. He notices everything we need. This covenant isn't just that he'll provide everything we ask for, No, he knows and notices things that we don't even ask for. He knows all of our needs. He notices everything we need. Our needs do not go unnoticed. He sees everything. Psalm 139 says, even before the request is on our tongue, even before the word is in our mouth, he knows it. Even if we don't ask for it, he still knows it and he still provides. But he tells us to ask. Think of that. He wants us to ask, but he knows all of our needs. He notices Even the very hairs of our head are numbered, verse 7 says. He knows how many, he knows everything about us. He treasures us, loves us, and so he's taking notice and caring for us. Look at verse 32. He gives us his kingdom. Wow, not just food, not just clothes. The kingdom of heaven is given to the church, followers of Jesus. Now, this part of the covenant makes it abundantly clear that this promise isn't just to everybody in the world. No, this covenant promise is to specific people. The followers of Jesus are going to receive the kingdom of God. Okay? This is astounding. Not just clothes, not just food. Jesus gives us the kingdom. The whole kingdom. Wow. Why would Jesus say, don't be anxious? Don't be afraid. Why would he say that? Why would he say, little flock, fear not? Why would he say that? Because that's exactly what we do. We are afraid all the time. We are anxious all the time. We look at the world around us, the things shaking and crumbling and afraid, and we're afraid, and we feel like our whole life is crumbling. Everything is going to be taken from us, right? Or when a marriage crumbles, when your home, when your family is in crisis, everything's going to be taken, right? We're afraid of those things all the time. And our Lord Jesus knows this. And so he says, little flock, fragile, afraid, 
fearful, little, timid flock. Don't be afraid. The power that is holding us is the power that holds the whole kingdom and gives the kingdom to his chosen ones. This is a look into the covenant promises of God to his people, to the church, that just opens up our eyes to see what it means to belong to God. I want to focus on that aspect of covenant church membership. This is what it means to belong to God. Many people don't like to talk about church membership because, oh, you're going to expect things from me. You, you expect me to be, to be committed. You expect me to show up when I don't want to show up. Well, you know, God shows up. Jesus showed up. And he told us to show up. Show up and follow Jesus. Show up and believe. Show up and love each other like he has loved us. Yeah, he does say, show up. Be committed. Because look what he did for us. So our commitment isn't the basis of the covenant. We don't receive these things because of our commitment. We receive all these things because of his. We belong because he made us belong. And I want us to see that. This is what it means to belong to the kingdom, belong to the church. I'm thinking of these things because there is a great danger. There are many great dangers right now, of course. I can't even name them all, but I'm sensing there's a great danger happening among us, especially among our younger ones, but all of us. I want to toss out a word. Many of you have heard it before. Nihilism. Some pronounce it nihilism. It's a philosophy that many people have talked about. It's based on, it comes from the Latin word nihil. It means, the Latin word means empty or nothing or meaningless. Nihilism was a, is a philosophy talked about a lot by German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, you may have read about this. You may have, other philosophers talk about it too, of course, but it's, it's a way of thinking, it's a philosophy, it's a way of life that can infect all of us. And I think we're in danger of this right now. And I think we need to watch for this very carefully. Watch yourself for this. So nihilism is a way of thinking that takes place when someone's values, traditions, or institutions, trusted things, fail them. When their way of life, their traditions, Their leaders turn out to be hypocrites, turn out to be failures, turn out to be weak, and things are taken from them. They suddenly feel as if everything they've believed is false. Everything they've thought is fake. And when that happens, people's worlds cave in. People collapse. Nations collapse. I think we need to be very conscious of this right now as individuals, as a church, and as a nation. So Friedrich Nietzsche um, talked about this, thought about this. Uh, He grew up in a religious home, believing in God, but became an unbeliever. Uh, These things happened to him. Um, He is the one who popularized the phrase, the statement, God is dead. For him, everything God had said turned out to be dead, wrong. For him, in his mind. Now, we know that's not true because we know the Bible is true. We know God isn't dead, and everything God says is true. But for him, it looked like everything he had put his hopes in, trusts in, were false. God is dead. But for him, really, there is no God. And as he talked about these things, his life just spiraled more and more out of control. Not only did his traditions and other things he believed in collapse, he collapsed. At age 44, he had a mental collapse, and he spent the rest of his life incapable. He was cared for by his sister, who, interestingly, didn't collapse. She continued in her faith in what God had said and cared for her brother until his early death at age 56. Well, anyone who thinks this way is sure to collapse. Anyone who has nothing to hold on to, all their beliefs have collapsed. Who can withstand that? This is where God's word, the gospel, gives us something of great strength, great power. Because as Christians, we belong to a God who doesn't collapse. The truth of God's word, the gospel, doesn't disappear or disappoint. Many things will disappoint in the world and in ourselves, but not God's word, not God himself. And so church membership, what the Bible says about it, speaks to this in very powerful ways. And so I have the sense that right now we believers need to draw near, close, hold fast to the body 
in what God says about our identity in Christ and our identity as the body of Christ. Only the church has this unshakable truth to hold out to the world. Only the church has it. No one else has this. And so church, we need it, we need to hold fast, and we need to hold this out to the world. So here are a couple things. Just to say, follow along here in your notes, what is covenant church membership? Well, it's the Bible's description of the church and our belonging to God. What is church member? What is covenant church membership? The Bible describes the church this way. God makes the covenant. The church is part of the covenant. He makes this covenant with the church. This is how the Bible describes the church. We belong to him because of his promise. Not because of our promise, but because of his. All right? So let's understand this and let's hold on to this. One thing we learn about this from the Bible, God's covenant of grace creates church members, believers. God's covenant of grace creates church members. We don't make ourselves church members. The pastors don't make church members. The church doesn't make church members. God does. God makes them. His covenant of grace that rescues us from lostness, unbelief, and sin and darkness, reaches down and picks us up by grace. Grace alone, just because of his love, he reaches down and picks up sinners and says, you're mine. This covenant is yours. You belong to me. You're mine. God's covenant of grace creates church members, makes us belong. Second thing, the members have duties to show grace to each other. Covenant church membership means we belong to him, because of his covenant, but he tells us to love each other as we have been loved. In this way, the church lives out that covenant of grace. We didn't invent it. We didn't do it for ourselves. We've received it freely, and now we give it to one another. We show that love and faithfulness and patience and gentleness and all those things. We live out the covenant of grace toward each other so that we're all reminded we belong to God. This is the beauty of the body of Christ, and he wants us to live this way. There was a New York Times article last Friday about the increase in Americans seeking psychics and tarot card readers and fortune tellers and all those kinds of things. And, the, and it stands to reason the state of mind that we're all in and what's happening in our country, people are going to get their fortunes read like never before. There's this particular tarot card reader, apparently famous in Los Angeles, named Zulima. Zulima made a shocking prediction before the November 3 election. She reached into her tarot cards, tarot cards, right, and have pictures on them. She reached into her pile of tarot cards, and she pulled out a card, and this card is supposed to have the prediction, the prophecy of what's going to happen to the future of our nation. You know what was on the card? On the card was a picture of this tower building, tall tower, and lightning striking the top of the tower and you know, just going to destroy this tower, and people from the top of the building were leaping to their death. And she said that that tower, lightning striking, it represents the end of an era, the end of a nation as we know it, coming to an end. Is she right? A lot of people think she is. They're going to get their fortunes ready to find, to, to find out. Well, when this kind of talk and this kind of thinking enters into people's minds, what will they do? They will do all kinds of things. They will break things. They will hurt people. They will hurt themselves. But this is not our God. This is not what Christians do. This is not what Christians are. We're to go to God's word to see what he says, who he is, and who we are because of who he is. This is really happening in the minds of many. But when we look at God's word, we find something sustaining us that will never let us fall or jump. This will sustain us. And we see this in the promises of what church membership is. So where is covenant church membership in the Bible, by the way? Where is it? Well, covenants are found throughout the Bible. If you'll look on the backside of your sermon guide, there's a whole list. There's a list of eight covenants, eight major covenants found in the Bible. I'm not going to cover them today. I want to give them to you. Go look at them. Underline them in your Bible. Beautiful things. Look at covenant number eight. The last one is the covenant of redemption. Now, they're covenants with Adam. God will send the Redeemer who will crush Satan's head. God's covenant with Noah. that He'll never again destroy the whole world with a flood. God's covenant with Abraham and Moses and David. God's promise to David is he will send 
a true king who will always be on the throne, always bless and deliver his people. That is Jesus. And when you get to the New Testament, Jesus comes saying, I'm here. He says, this is now the new covenant, the king who comes to rescue us by dying for us, to cleanse us from our sins for those of us who believe. So this new king, this forever king has come and he gives this new covenant. And the last covenant on the list, number eight, the covenant of redemption is his promise to rescue, save, make clean, forgive, give eternal life. This is where we find what we are and what the church is. This is church membership. He makes us his own in this beautiful covenant. So several things about this. This covenant of redemption is the covenant made by the Father to save sinners through Jesus' suffering. This covenant is made by the Father to save sinners through Jesus' suffering. So these covenants, these promises are God's vow. This is what he will do. And he always does what he covenants, promises. Always. He never breaks any promise. So in the covenant of redemption, there's this promise made within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, before the world was created. In eternity past, there's this covenant made between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that the Father makes. The Father says, he will save sinners. If Jesus will offer his body as a sacrifice. If Jesus will make the payment for sins, the Father will save them. Isaiah 53, 10 says this. So Father, to the Son, you give your body as a sacrifice. If you do this, I will accept that, and I will save and redeem sinners by your sacrifice. You will make them clean. They will be given life because of you. So this covenant is made by the Father, and this covenant is accomplished by the Son. The Son, Jesus, says, Father, I will obey. And he humbles himself, and he obeys. That's the second thing. The covenant is accomplished by the Son dying in the place of sinners. We see this in many places, like John 17, 4, where Jesus says right before he goes to the cross, he's praying to the Father, and he says that he has accomplished everything that the Father has sent him to accomplish. And we know that mostly is in his going to the cross to perish, pouring out his blood to cleanse sinners, to do what the Father had covenanted. If he will do this, if he'll pour out his blood as a sacrifice, the Father will accept it and will cleanse sinners. Jesus does it. He accomplishes the covenant on our behalf. Now, look, this is so important because no sinner can make themselves clean. None of us can make ourselves right. None of us can obey God and make God see that we deserve him to bless us and give us our clothes and our food and give us the kingdom. None of us can do that. But Jesus accomplishes it in his death. His blood washes us so that the Father sees us, those who believe, clean, forgiven by Jesus, and the Father accepts us. So this covenant is made by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and applied by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit applies this covenant to sinners, opening their eyes, convicting them of sin, drawing them, calling them to come and believe, come and accept this covenant, come and trust this Savior. And when they do, what does the Holy Spirit do? He applies the covenant to them. They confess their sins. They repent. They believe, and they are washed clean, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside them. And something else, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, the Holy Spirit baptizes them into the body. Non-belongers, outsiders, because the covenant made by the Father, accomplished by the Son, is applied by the Spirit, outsiders are brought and made insiders. Non-members are made members. The Holy Spirit does that. It follows up and says in verse 18, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, he has placed every member in the body just as he chose. This is a covenant promise that God made. We now belong to him, and he's going to keep all his promises because of his love, because of his commitment between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. This is what he's done. And then there's one more bit there. This covenant is lived out by members doing one another commands. 
Those who have now been made members of the body, we've received this covenant promise. We've been made clean. We now belong to God forever. We now live this out among ourselves, forgiving one another just like we've been forgiven, loving one another just like we've been loved, showing grace to one another just like we've received grace from God. Do you see how this works? This is what the body is. This is church membership. This is what God wants for all of us, but not just us. God has told us to go and tell this to the whole world. God is calling all sinners everywhere, come to Jesus and believe this promise. And all who turn from their other identities, their other loyalties, other allegiances, allegiances mostly to themselves and their sin, turning from those to Jesus, to believe him, trust him, submit to him, follow him. They are outsiders who are now made insiders. Sinners condemned to death, now forgiven and given eternal life, and they will never perish. And they're now part of the little flock. Don't be afraid, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the beauty of what church membership is all about. So what does this covenant do to people? Well, we believers who hear this and understand this and hold fast to this, it does things to us. It calls us, it enables us, it empowers us to live by faith. We don't live by fear. We don't live by anger. We don't live by wrath. We don't live by the value we have through other allegiances. We swear those off, and we hold fast to who we are in Jesus. One of the stories I grew up hearing throughout my childhood there's a lot of those y'all have heard by now. I grew up in country, countryville, West Tennessee, and uh, all my family's still there and love the memories I grew up with as a child. One of those memories is my grandfather, Harvey Newman. Harvey Newman was a farmer, raised cotton. He also worked at the cotton gin. A cotton gin is where they take the raw cotton from the fields, they gin it, they process it, and turn it into product that clothing fabric companies turn into what we wear. So at the cotton gin... They work all day, all night. My grandfather's there, you know, helping run the cotton gin. One day, or night, I don't know which one it was, but one of the men working in the cotton gin uh, was working around dangerous machines, all right, blades, saws, you know, stretching and, you know, the cotton. And one of the men has an accident with what his hand gets caught in one of the machines, and one of his fingers is cut severely and almost completely severed from his hand. So my grandfather sees it. And my grandfather's like a hero in my mind because of what he does. My grandfather sees it, and he goes, I mean, just lightning fast. He grabs some kind of cloth, and he grabs the man's hand, and he holds the finger in place, and he holds it with pressure to stop the bleeding and to hold the flesh in place. And someone goes to get a vehicle, a pickup truck, and they go get into the pickup truck. And my grandfather goes the whole way to see the doctor holding that man's hand just like that all the way. And the doctor stops the bleeding and sews that man's finger back on. Now, that's an amazing story. I mean, I, you know, Harvey Newman was known for a lot of heroic things like that. But think of that. We believers are now made part of the body of Christ we cannot, we, we feel we might be severed. We might be removed. Think of who's holding us. Someone way greater than my grandpa. Way more heroic. The covenant promise of God is literally holding us. Holding us and will never let us fall. Such confidence, such strength. When all the rest of the world is fearing and collapsing, God doesn't let his people collapse. He holds us up. That's who we are. We embrace this. We love this. We belong to this. We live this out. We remind each other of these truths. So think of where church membership is found in the Bible. It's found in places like 1 Corinthians 6.15. Do you, know, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Church membership says you, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, your body doesn't belong to you. Your body belongs to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. You're his forever. 
It's also found, membership is also found in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For just as the body, human body, is one but has many members, many body parts, hands, fingers, toes, eyes, ears, nose, many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Church membership is like a human body. We belong to this body. God made us belong, and he's sustaining us and keeping us. Think of that. We also see it in Ephesians 2, 19. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. God's covenant promise says you're no longer an outsider. You're an insider. You belong to the family, the household of God. We are his. Not because we convinced God we deserve it. Not because we did something to deserve it. We can't. Because he did something that deserves it. He made us belong. This is his promise. And so every time you go to a wedding, you're seeing a covenant lived out right in front of your eyes. Those vows husband and wife, groom and bride make to one another, that's a covenant. Remember what the covenant says at the wedding? I, Jonathan, take you, Jenny, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I pledge thee my faithfulness. Nobody goes to a wedding and hears those wedding vows and says, why would you do that? Don't do that. Nobody does. Well, Somebody maybe who's not right, we go to that wedding, we say, oh, that is beautiful. And our hearts long for that, right? We all long for that. God made marriage, and he made that vow, he made that commitment to show us there is one greater, far greater. Jesus is the true groom, eternal and greater groom who came and laid down his life making a covenant vow that can never be broken. We belong to him. We love this. So why should we embrace covenant church membership? Well, because, think of the reasons why. More than I'm going to name now, but like this, we need to be surrounded by the body, continually being reminded that we belong because we keep forgetting. We keep going back to fear and anxiety and worry. We need to be surrounded by the body, reminding us, no, this is what God said. This is what he's going to do. He's going to keep you. He's going to keep his promise. He's never going to break it. We need to be surrounded with that. And second thing, we need to be in the body surrounding others, reminding them. We need to be reminded, and we need to give reminders to all the other members of the body. Don't forget. Don't be afraid. This is what he said. This is who you are. Hold fast. Three, we need help remembering these promises are based on God's grace and not our good behavior. We need help remembering that because we keep drifting back into thinking, oh, if I don't do enough, I don't deserve it. He's going to change his mind. I'm not living up to it enough. We need to be reminded this is not based on your goodness. This is not based on your performance. This is based on Jesus' performance. He accomplished this. He did it. You rest. You confess. Humbly admit it's okay. This is not about you. It's about him, and you receive it. We need help remembering this covenant is unbreakable because we live in an evil world where there is an evil enemy seeking to destroy the church. There is an enemy. You have an enemy seeking to destroy you. We need this. We need to be reminded so that we're not led astray and despair. So church, let's hold fast to this. Let's live this out. Let's embrace this. Let's don't reject commitment. Let's don't reject membership. This is what God has done. He's holding us fast. Let's hold fast to him and each other. So here's some next steps for you to take this week. Think about these. Let's let's confess, let's commit, let's pray, and we're going to sing, and we're going to rejoice about this, all right? So here's some next steps to take. If you have not committed yourself to membership in this body, commit. Take the step. Commit. Sell out. Now, this is not the church for you. If you're visiting or from somewhere else or whatever reason, well, go find a church where you are, where you can, where you agree, and commit. 
But if this is here for you, if this is your church, commit all the way, all the way in, all right? Stop listening to the conspiracy theories and news and stories of betrayal. Stop listening to them. And listen to the one who doesn't betray. Don't be filled with all those fearful things. Listen to Jesus' promise. Hold close to the body. Bring food to your life group. Serve your life group. And when you serve them, a transaction is going to happen in your heart. You're going to be giving grace, and it's going to remind you of the grace given to you. Go and serve. Find somebody who's sick, somebody who can't do for themselves. Go find them. Member of our church or not, there's plenty out in the community. Go and serve them and care for them, and God will use you to awaken them and call them to come too. Open up to your group, your life group, your D group, your whatever. Open up to your group and confess your sin, confess your doubts, confess your fears, and let them surround you and encourage you and strengthen you. You haven't been baptized yet? Be baptized. If you're a follower of Jesus, you believe the gospel, you turn from your sins, be baptized to declare your faith and declare this covenant is yours. Now let's pray. I want to pray for us, for God's help. And then we're going to sing and let's rejoice about these things. Let's commit ourselves to these things. So Jesus, as we've heard these things, please help us now hold fast. And in our singing, in our worship, help us believe. Help us hold fast. Help our hearts grasp and love these things that you have said are true. Jesus, work in us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.